Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello, listener. It is, in fact, time for some very honest business building chat and all for the benefit of my quest with this podcast to help 100,000 brave business builders start and or stay in business. And that's me taking the advice from our guest today, the very generous Penny from Hacking Happy Co, to ensure we're sharing our purpose widely while asking for what we want and embracing the rejections that get us closer to the yes. So, well, what do I want? Well, I want a great brand to invest in this show so that I can get closer to that 100,000 number, to supporting 100,000 businesses to thrive, individuals to thrive in their business, and to start to shift the needle on the rubbish failure rate, the unfair failure rate in business and in small business in particular. I also want a publishing deal, a diary full of speaking engagements, and a thriving side business helping brands build their own impactful podcasts, so not much. This chat is guaranteed to supercharge your belief in yourself. You're going to hear about midlife awakenings, the time we have to take to develop the wisdom we need in this gig, why we have to celebrate the progress and not just the accomplishments the role of compassion and mental recharge in business, undertaking rejection therapy, and of course, why you have to share your quest, your purpose in business, widely. I would love to hear your purpose, listener, so do slide on into my DMs on Instagram or LinkedIn. You can always find me at Unemployed and Afraid and make sure to leave the show a five-star review if it's helping you feel supported on your own journey. Let's get into the chat. I'm here with Penny Lacasso, happiness hacker, international speaker, published author and adaptability researcher, budding psychologist, podcaster, yoga teacher, and the human behind Hacking Happy Co. Penny is on a mission to teach 10 million women how to flourish on their terms, empowering professional women to go from stuck and emotionally exhausted to finding their spark again with one-on-one or group coaching based on positive psychology principles engaging speaking and workshop platforms, and sharing her insights far and wide. Penny believes that whether you dream about quitting the nine to five or seeking more nature, chill and family time without incessantly checking out the phone, you can wake in the morning feeling energized for the day ahead. Voted one of the most influential female entrepreneurs in Australia, Penny is her own ongoing experiment, which we will get right into with over 20 years experience in enabling adaptability to get us all finding our flow to flourish. She's partnered with Google, Microsoft, Salesforce and Lululemon, just to name a few, and has created the world first international adaptability quotient, don't say that three times fast, which saw her published in the American Consulting Journal of Psychology and on board as a Harvard Business Review contributor. As a kindred spirit of entrepreneurial gusto and believer in the ever-evolving space of us, I can't wait to hear your story, Penny. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Oh, Kim, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I never, ever feel comfortable hearing any of that. (laughs) I don't know why. I should be proud, and I am proud, but I just think that's maybe an entrepreneurial flaw. I don't know about you, but when people read my bio, I'm just going, oh... And I think you've just started with our first lesson of the day, which is we all feel like this. It doesn't matter how many credentials you get under your belt. We all feel the cringe when it comes to like being pumped up or being promoted. And, you know, it just, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. And, and the thing is we should celebrate it. But I think also it's a very um, female thing, like women not great at promoting themselves, not great at selling themselves. And I've been doing this for nine years now as an entrepreneur. And I used to manage large, like multi-billion dollar businesses in sales in a global giant. But when it's yourself, yeah, like you say, it feels a bit like pumping your entire up. <laughs> But anyway, should celebrate it. Absolutely. Or as we were talking about before, holding the two things in the same space, learning to celebrate it and learning to understand the cringe is perfectly fine. So I want you to have in your mind for a moment, think about your best friend. And I would love to know how they might describe you. (laughs) Emma asked me that. And if you knew my best friend, you'd know why I laugh out loud. My best friend is 10 years older, 15 years older than me. He's 65. And he's a beautiful gay man and he is completely inappropriate, completely unconventional and, yeah, it goes against the grain of everything. 
he would describe me as the word that comes to my mind is dysfunctional, which is probably not a good word to describe it, but dysfunctional more in terms of with him, I've always been up for anything. And I think it's funny when I think about this and speak it out loud, I think that's kind of how I rolled in my life. So he's completely unconventional. I'm completely unconventional in the way that I parent, in the way that I live my life as someone who's nearly 50. And I think also in the way that I do my business. So I'd say, yeah, he maybe un- unconventional and not like everyone else. I think that's how he would describe me. There's just so much to love in that. Reowning the term dysfunctional <laughs> and making it our own because who wants to who wants to do things how we we think we're supposed to do it anyway? And being unconventional just stinks of opportunity for me. Yeah, and it, I think it's funny. Like with someone studying psychology, like dysfunction as a word, I think there's so many words that get a bad rap, right? The dysfunction as a word speaks to, you know, you not being normal, you not showing the line or, you know, you making it hard for people. But I feel like dysfunction is like core to being in this space of unemployed and afraid, right? Without a doubt, because you need to not toe the line. You need to be able to see what other people can't see. You need to be able to swim against school. You need to be brave enough to do all of that in order to be able to make your way in what is, I call it a roller coaster, you know, this space that you and I have chosen to occupy is renowned. And people don't speak about it. If you watch social media, you'll think that the roller coaster just sits on high. But the reality is, I would say the highs are higher and the lows are lower when you choose this journey because it's personal. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And this is so relevant to right this moment because I have a recency bias to this. Adam Grant's book, Hidden Potential, in it, he described a, a young child's perspective of a roller coaster, which was it's a thing that was invented for us to face our fears, do hard things, and have fun. And I was like, yeah, damn straight. <laughs> That's business. I can <laughs> totally see that. That's a good recency bias. See, <laughs> you've just validated my analogy. I love this. <laughs> What's next? What's next is what came before. So well before Hacking Happy Co was your business and all that it entails within it, who were you? I was who you expected me to be. (laughs) Not dysfunctional. Or if I, no, I was dysfunctional. I was damn good at hiding it. So I was your typical corporate executive. I spent 16 years in a global giant because I ticked all the boxes I was told would make me successful, which I thought would land me in a place of happiness and contentment and fulfillment. And I found myself at the age of 39. Some people call it a midlife crisis. I like to think of it as a midlife awakening because I honestly feel like I woke up. And it's not that life before that was bad. So I don't, you know, I wasn't depressed or having mental health issues. Or, you know, like it wasn't, it was, it was good. And I worked with a lot of amazing people who have now become clients, funnily enough. But it was that I'd been sold this dream of what success looked like. And I realized that what I'd been sold was not mine. And I'd never in 39 years actually asked myself, what does success slash happiness look like for me? And it wasn't until I stepped out in my backyard And my three-year-old son was in the backyard and I still get chills when I I speak about this. And I said to him, hey, buddy, come inside, let's hang out. And he said to me, I can't, mum, I'm too busy. He was three. And I'm like, where do you think a child gets the word busy from? And what do you think the word busy says to a three-year-old in terms of their value, their importance, their place within a home? And it was like a lightning bolt through the heart. And I realized that everything that I was doing was in pursuit of more. It was in pursuit of more material things, more success, more, it was just stuff. And that caused me to step back and ask myself, what does success slash happiness look like on my terms? And am I showing up as not only the human, but the parent that I want to be? And the answer was no. (laughs) So that's where I was. I've had the privilege of learning a little bit about your story and how you came to bridge that gap from there to now and and the actions that you took. But for the listener, I would love you to to share that blow it all up moment. It was a blow it all up moment. And it's funny because, you know, it's nine years this week since I started my business, which is a big milestone in the space of unemployed and afraid because most businesses, I think it's something like at the moment, 70% of businesses fail within the first four years. It's the stat that I pulled out today. So yeah, it's nine years. So the blow it up moment was nine years ago. And basically what I did was when I asked myself what happiness success looks like for me on my terms, there were a couple of things that came up. It was 
positively impacting the lives of others, being humanly connected, sharing experiences and being present and in the moment. And they were all the things that I'd sidelined in pursuit of more. So knowing that I was like, well, I don't know what this is going to look like, but I need to realign my life to bringing more of those things into the everyday. So within a seven month period, I left a 16 year career and a half a million salary at the top of my game. I relocated my family from Perth back to Melbourne. I left an 18 year relationship and I started my own purpose-driven company, hackinghappy.co, with the sole intent of helping others define flourishing on their terms and learn really practical and evidence-backed ways to bring more of that into each day. I have a very um, layered question that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work to make it make sense. But what I think is really interesting about your business is how you just described it then is that you you changed your life, kind of left behind what didn't feel right anymore to, to change your life, to get something back for yourself, to flourish for yourself. But the measure of doing that or the, I guess, the machine of doing that was helping other people. So it's kind of like you're rebuilding yourself while rebuilding others at the same time. So I guess my question being multi-layered is, was that an active choice at the time? Or was there a time where you thought your business might be something else and then you realise actually it's okay, I can do this at the same time? Oh, <laughs> such good question. Oh, gosh. When I started, so that, that was the intent, right? I wanted to help others flourishing. But how that manifested when I started out was I dropped, do you want an epic fail? I dropped $10,000 because here's the thing. I thought, I know businesses. I've been managing multi-billion dollar businesses. I know businesses. It's very different when you're running a multi-billion dollar business and you've got loads of staff and multi-million dollar budgets, which I know you can relate to, yeah, and you're spending someone else's money <laughs> to having a staff of one and the money that's being spent on the business is coming out of your bank account and you are sales, marketing, operations, accounting. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> it is extremely different. So I basically was like, well, I had some money. So I was like, you know, I, I'm going to, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a platform and I'm going to help. Because what I started to see when I stepped into starting my business was I was meeting with a lot of small business owners and um, they were good at working in the business, not on it. So I dropped 10 grand and created a platform to help small business owners get better at working on the business rather than in it because I felt that would help them flourish. And here's the kicker. Within six months, I ditched the whole thing, shut it down because all I kept getting asked because I was being active on social media about how I was trying to work out what the hell I was doing, right? And back then, this is nine years ago, people weren't really doing that in the same way that they are now, especially corporate people. And so I was like, I've got no idea what I'm doing. I'm just trying to work this out as I go. And my following is on LinkedIn. So especially on LinkedIn, people weren't out there sharing the fact that they had no idea what they were doing. So I started sharing that I had no idea. And what was really interesting was I started to get asked to speak on panels and for communities about how I turned my whole life upside down in pursuit of happiness. And if there is one lesson I have learned in nine years is that you have to listen to what's calling you providing it's in alignment with those, for me, those four things, human connection, positively impacting the lives of others, being present and in the moment, you know, and sharing experiences. Because when you start a business, let's be honest, we have no idea what we're doing. People think they do, but I'll guarantee you, you will look back and you will go, that was the year of no fucking idea. Because it just is, right? You, you have to experiment your way to working out your path and there's a real knack that I think that you grow into over time. In trauma, we call this attunement in trauma therapy. And it's being not attuned so much to, well, it is, but it's being attuned to what you're being called to. And noticing it, it's almost like this intuition, this wisdom within where you start to notice these kind of moments where it's like, maybe I should step into a little more of that. I love that. And I love how you refer to the, the one man band because you know, anybody, again, who has worked in that corporate environment knows that when somebody isn't performing great in that environment, you have this really wonderful thing called a performance review or a PIP or a whatever it's called in your place of business where you can put those people through a process of upskilling or, uh, you know, working on it like to help. But there's no performance reviewing yourself. Like you can't, <laughs> when it's all on you, you're like, I suck at this thing and now I just have to learn how to not suck at it. And I don't even know, you know, where to get started on that. So it's such a great point you raise around just the the difference of headspace and getting used to that different approach because you do realize that 
when you step out of that environment, what you could achieve in a short period of time within a corporate environment is much, much different to what you can achieve when you're out on your own. That has been a huge lesson for me. I have had zero patience when I walked out of my corporate role. Zero. Like I thought things things had to happen like that, you know. And so therefore when I walked out and, you know, one year later I wasn't killing it. Four years later, I feel like I'm not killing it. And I'm just as impatient as ever. So it's, it's really about learning that patience and that trial and error. But I really love that you told that story of your first version of Hacking Happy Co., which is what it is today, that first business model under a different premise, under a different purpose, with a different execution, how important those steps are to get you to nine years now to go through. I mean, that's, I imagine at the time though, grappling with that narrative of this is what I'm trying to do. Let me share with people what I'm trying to do to then pivot to something else was deeply challenging. Could you share with me a little bit about then the pivot from this, you know, platform that you're building to going, "Mm, nope, it's not going to be that. That's not going to be the thing. I can, but I have to touch on something you said, because I think it's really important for you and for your listeners. So these four years and not killing it, I'm nine years. And I still don't feel like I'm killing it, even with all the accolades, even with all the credentials, because here's the thing, you will always keep moving the goalposts, especially if you step into this space, because you're someone, I'm guessing, if you're listening and you're in this space, you're someone who's reaction orientated, you get shit done, you make things happen. That is like, that's your skill set, right? And here is what I have learned. And again, this is the magic of going back and studying psychology and understanding how the brain works is that what we do not do, which is a fundamental issue, is we do not celebrate the progress that we've made. The brain has a bias to things not going right, to the negative. And if there is one tiny thing that you and your listeners could do for yourself to acknowledge, yeah, acknowledge that you are killing it, is those may not be the words you use, is to actually just sit down and write down the progress you've made. Just look at the progress you've made because I'll guarantee you, you're four years in, right? You are way further ahead than what you were four years ago. So what does that look like and how do you take a moment of pause and a breath and one, acknowledge that progress and two, celebrate it? Because that is what this journey is about. Because if you just focus on all the things that don't work out, because I'll tell you there will be heaps, you'll end up leaving or you'll end up crazy. Because you can't, I would say, you can't get yeses unless you get noes. There's going to be loads of noes you're going to get. Rejection is going to, hit you in the face time and time again, but that is how you get the opportunities. So celebrating the progress is so important because the way we find motivation as human beings is through noticing the progress. If you ignore the progress, your motivation will wane and it will be very hard to show up every day for your soul and this dream that you have around the business. You're so right. That bias towards focusing on the negative is something we can all Oh, feel, and but particularly on those days where we get three or four of them in a, in a whack, which happens. And then it's like, okay, the rebuild, okay, the refocus, which is why I think that, and I know I talk about it a lot on this show, uh, so the listener will be like, yeah, Kim, I get it. But that focus on that personal growth and that aspect of self, looking at your habits, mm-hmm. how you treat your body, your mind, what you do for yourself to unwind, all of those things are just so very important to to keep us going. I have to remind myself constantly when the anxiety is high and the symptoms are present and the uh, frustration is there is to, you know, sit for 10 minutes. For goodness sakes, woman, don't scroll Instagram. Like go, (laughs) go have a meditate for a minute. I want to delve into, I guess, a little bit of that for you, how your the way you treat yourself as a business builder has has changed through those nine years. What's What's been the fundamentals for you? So the first thing I want to touch on, because it draws on what we've just spoken about, is perhaps the most important thing I do each week is a reflection process. And it only takes 10 minutes and I do it on a Friday. And what I do is I ask myself, what worked, what didn't, and what am I going to do differently? When I ask myself those three questions, what worked, what didn't, and what am I going to do differently? I'm not just talking about the business. I talk about the business. I reflect on myself as a parent. Like, have I made myself available? And have I been present when I've made myself available for my son? Because that's the reason why I started this business, you know? And how have I shown up for myself from a health and wellbeing perspective? And I look at those three elements and it takes 10 minutes. And again, it helps me one, celebrate the progress and acknowledge that good things have happened in a week because often we don't do that. And it also provides me with a platform to actually be able to disrupt the pattern for next week If I notice, because I don't know about you, 
But I can tell you doing this process every week and I, I actually traffic light it. So I traffic light um, how I've showed up as a parent. I traffic light how I've showed up in the business and I traffic light how I've showed up in terms of alcohol, in terms of nutrition, like because these are the things that I know in terms of sleep um, are fundamental to how I want to show up. Doing that enables me to then say, okay, well, how do I course correct for the week ahead? And I notice the patterns, you know, like I can see when I don't do these things, how it impacts everything because I've got the traffic light system. Like it's really apparent where it's like, oh, three weeks, I've had a drink during the week. I don't want to do that. What's causing it? So you start to find levers that you can pull and play with. The other things that are fundamental to me that are quite different from nine years ago my number one priority, and it's scheduled in my diary for the week ahead, is micro moments of recharge. So there is a brilliant theory in psychology called the conservation of resources theory. And how it works is that you are one human with 24 hours in the day. We all have our constraints. When you wake each morning, you wake with a set level of mental and physical resources available to you. Now, how you choose to use those throughout the day will determine, like a mobile phone, battery, if you want to think of it like that, whether your little battery inside is charged up or whether it's completely depleted. Now, what happens is for most of us, we don't have these micro moments of recharge because we're trying to keep up with God knows what and God knows who. And so what happens is when the warning light goes on and says our resources, mental and physical, are low, predominantly mental for most of us, we just basically walk over the warning signal and keep pushing on. Now, here's what happens when you do that and you don't have these micro moments of recharge. One, I can guarantee you, you are not performing at your best. So if you want to give the best to your business, it's not going to happen, right? And you will wake the next day wondering why you feel like your battery is on half charge. Doing this consistently over time is how you get burnt out. And I cannot tell you how many amazing humans that are high performing, you know, and have had unbelievable success have walked over that warning light to the point where they're burnt out. That's so relatable. And I think... When you're kind of doing your own thing and you're alone as well, it's without that practice, like it's it's such a wonderful practice do it, doing it like that. And, and I was reflecting, thinking you know, I, I have a very simple journal um, that I just write in at the end of the day. It's just a small paragraph and it forces me to only write a few things. Otherwise, I, I do tend to go on a tangent. Just that very small practice, you know, it, it reminds me of how helpful that is. Seeing, like you said, following patterns and starting to learn about yourself, which takes time and it takes you know weeks and months to see okay I did this and this happened and I felt this way I did this this happened and this felt you know this way and and again it kind of almost speaks to that element of like self-trust knowing the what without the why and you know that patience in in growing your business and, and kind of showing up for yourself are really helpful tools there's some pretty wonderful credentials that I read out in the bio. So some pretty big names, some pretty cool places, um, some some wonderful things. And I always find this really interesting because as we all become marketers in our own businesses, we realize the relevance and the importance of social proof. So, you know, other people finding us valuable, whether it be through testimonials or those wonderful big names and publications that we can leverage off of to, to get people to know that we're worth the investment of time and, and of resources. But for so many you know, of us, the listeners, before you have that social proof, it's kind of like, all right, how, how do you get from you know, here to here? What are, those, what are those stepping stones? Could you share a little bit about some of your stepping stones before the social proof, before, I mean, let's just have a moment of celebration for Harvard Business Review, like fucking amen. That is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, so you're getting to that phase of, of finding them. How did you get yourself out there? Oh, I think this is such a good question. And it's so funny. I've got, I've got a note to your podcast on credentialing because I think it's a really interesting topic. And I have so many prospective clients that come to me and they want to start a business or they want to do something different in their business. And they're like, okay, so what degree, like what qualification, like what do I need to do before I start doing that thing? And I think herein lies the problem. I think social proof and credentials are very helpful, okay? So I don't want to diminish the value of that, but I equally think that they paralyze people from action and they stop people from taking action now. And I honestly believe that you, unless you're a surgeon, well, you need to get that qualification, right? Because I don't want no one operating on me that's not qualified in that domain. But in the space of helping people, like for many things, you can start trying to do that thing in parallel, parallel with getting the credential. But a lot of people think to me that they've got to go and get a, some qualification around it. And what I see is a lot of people spending a lot of money 
on courses and programs that they don't need. Okay, so that's the first thing I just want to say around that. But when you said what was the first step, it's so interesting because there were so many steps. Like there's this brilliant tool that I teach clients which was fundamental to me getting so many of these opportunities and it's called 100 no's. So there is, um, there's a therapy called rejection therapy and it's not wisely known, but it's something that I think is really powerful for building resilience and especially for doing the work that we do. So I came across this tool, which was the practice of rejection therapy and it's called 100 no's. So what you do is you write 100 no's down on a page And your goal is to get out there and ask for everything that you ever wanted that you've been too afraid to ask for because you were too scared of getting a no, right? So I did this and I stuck it on my wall. (laughs) I started, I was like, you know what, what have I got to lose? I've got nothing to lose. And so the way I built the platform to get those clients was by actually going out there and telling people about the change that I wanted to make in the world. So I have continuously for a long time been on a quest to teach 10 million women how to flourish on their terms and inject more of it into every day. And so I would always lead with that, no matter who I connected with, because people connect with purpose. They connect with why you want to do something. And it's like, who doesn't want to flourish? And, you know, most of the people I was meeting with were women. So they were like, I want that. That sounds great. And this is a woman that's actually made a career of it. And she calls herself a happiness hacker because she made that up because she thought that was a great thing because, hey, I can make it up because that's what an entrepreneur can do. (laughs) So I got out there and started sharing my quest, my purpose, and asking for all the things that I wanted. And you know what? A lot of people said no, but a lot of people remembered. And a lot of people said yes, or came back later and said yes. And the best example I've got of this amongst all of what you've shared, which I don't even think is in the the bio, I wanted to do a TED Talk. Who doesn't want to do a TED Talk, right? But this was like six years ago. And it turned out my, um, my speaking coach, because I was just starting to get into speaking, was owned the license for TEDx Melbourne. So I was lucky to meet him early in the early stages of my entrepreneurship. And I said to him, so here's the thing, just because he was my coach doesn't mean I get a free pass into TEDx. TEDx doesn't work like that. They are really stringent because they have a theme for every year, especially Melbourne. Like it's not like doing some university one or some, you know, not that there's, but like it's, it's very well credentialed. So they have a theme. And they want people to speak around that theme and they're very selective in who they choose. So I said to him, I want to do a TED Talk. I'm really keen to do it. So if there's ever an opportunity, let me know. That was like two years before the opportunity came. And lo and behold, I was flying back from Silicon Valley. I just had this amazing opportunity over there. I was at the carousel, getting my bags off the carousel. And my phone rang and it was John. And he said to me, TEDx Melbourne is in one week. We've just had someone pull out. Do you want to do a TED Talk? And this is why you ask for yeses and you accept the noes because you never know how it's going to land up. And I said, hell yes. And I was terrified. And I did it. And I think that was five years ago. And that TED Talk, like that is like one of, it's like Harvard Business Review. That moment in saying yes, still do there's opportunities to this day because it's a credential that a lot of people don't have. I love that story. First of all, I'm, I think I've written down and circled on my little uh, remarkable here. A hundred no's is a fantastic approach and I can completely resonate with the fear around the no's. I have definitely had a lot of them, but it takes me a lot to get them, to even put myself out there. You know, I always like to put my own experience there and not speak on behalf of the listener, but I'm sure that the listener feels the same way that there are times where even getting to the space of getting a no feels like a huge mountain because you're like, I've got to write this thing or I've got to do this proposal. I've got to make this look this way. I've got to make sure I've got a website that they I can, ref- whatever it takes. But just that throwing shit at a wall and seeing if it's, you know, it will stick me like this lofty goal. I mean, just this morning, my partner was giving me confidence with something and he's like, just just stop getting in your own way and you know getting a hundred no's is just such a powerful place to look at it because yes you know statistically we're gonna get a yes somewhere in there like there could be a yes but the yeses will blow you away Kim like the the, the thing that I learned from this practice is that it teaches you you are capable of so much more than you realize and the opportunities you get and I say this all the time Never, ever in my wildest dreams nine years ago did I imagine that I would have half of those things that you listed at the start. And I think if that hopefully is inspiring to your audience because it was never in my plan. It was because I stepped into being brave enough to ask for what I wanted and then realised maybe I could ask for more. 
maybe I could ask for something different. So I will share with you so you can drop in your show notes a link to it's 100 notes. I've got a template. People can download it and put it on their wall and give it a go. I'd love to hear. I get I still get messages to this day from people that I've shared it with over the years saying, you'll never believe what happened. It's such a great reminder. What I really liked about your sharing and that as well is, is how you defined your opener. So, you know, in order to get the 100 no's, so it's, you know, the pitch that's going in, whether it's through a phone call or an email, no matter the practicality of it, you talked about opening with a purpose and, you know, making sure that people understand that. And I think even sometimes that can be a space in which we as entrepreneurs allow ourselves to get tripped up is trying to make that pitch and that purpose land. You know, we overthink it or we make it too long, we make it too fluffy or too worthy. Tell me about your experience getting your purpose or or what you're hoping to achieve into that really well-defined explanation. Oh, it's a really good question. So it's, it's something that I started doing when I started my journey, funnily enough. I was very intrigued nine years ago because it was a new thing, not so much now, about conscious capitalism and purpose-led businesses because I had come from a world where purpose wasn't leading businesses, profit was. And I'm not saying that's significantly changed, but I'm just saying purpose wasn't such a big thing back then. And so I went to a conscious capitalism conference in Sydney and this was in the early days of conscious capitalism and I was like oh my god like there's all these people out there that want to create meaningful businesses and do good things in the world and they're making money out of it so I want to do that so I need to work out what my purpose is and funnily enough again when you put that stuff out there it's like you know they say when the student's ready the teacher appears and so there was an amazing woman at the time who was also a corporate SP called Carolyn Tate. And she'll find her. She's still around. She's an author. She's written a number of books around purpose and finding purpose. And um, I spent a bit of time with her and I learned how to create a purpose. And I still use it with clients to this day, the Ikigai model, which is the Japanese word for finding meaning, basically. And basically I started with that and I created what I call a shitty first draft. And I'm like, you know what? This is not going to be perfect. But you know what? It's going to act as a compass or something for me to, I can test it. I can road test it and see if it works. And so that's what I did. And then over time, like I always say with your purpose, you you kind of come up with your shitty first draft and then you, you sit and you marinate with it and you see how you go and then you come back to it. You know, I revisit it now every year because I feel like mine hasn't changed for a long time now because I feel like I nailed it. Like I really did. But it took me, I reckon, probably five years, five or six years of, revisiting it and going, does this still hold true? True. How would I tweak it to actually nail it? But it's so worth it when you do, because like I said to you, I can articulate it so clearly and it feels, I feel it in my heart when I say it. And I know it's right because it connects with other people. Every time I say it, I can feel like they buy into it because I'm so convinced that it's right for me great approach and again you know it comes through so many times and in so many ways through a conversation like we're we're privileged to have now is patience with yourself is trying and I love the shitty first draft concept and just getting something on paper and allowing that action to create the information you need to get to the thing and I I think there's this the, the kind of pink elephant that that comes underneath all of this for for people on this journey is you know all of those things somewhere in here or or like you're like, okay, yeah, all right, I can get something down and I can let it develop over time and I know time, you know, things will happen and I'll put myself out there over the weeks and eventually something will come come back in. But the pink elephant that kind of sits underneath that is the financial pressure. So, you know, we we know we're developing something and we know that our purpose is going to lead to all of these things. But there's this balance between putting things out there and spending all this work on, particularly if you've come from a space where you're used to getting paid in exchange for your time through a salary, but you're doing all of this work and it's not actually paying you, but it's paying off somewhere. And it's, you know, coming back in in spits and spurts. So this is my roundabout way of, I guess, challenging our conversation and our thinking for that person to be like, okay, how do we hold this promise to ourselves of allowing a shitty first draft, of allowing lots of no's, of doing all of the work that's required to get to the thing that we're, we're working towards and then the thing that will come after the thing? How do we hold that? in the same space as the financial journey and getting paid. But moreover, what was that like for you? So being able to generate enough revenue to keep you confident, to keep you going. I think that's been the hardest part of nine years, without a doubt. And it's funny, it's only probably in the last couple of months that I've had this appear to me. And if there is one gift that I can give your listeners, 
who are nowhere near nine years on their business journey. It's get damn curious about your relationship with money and the stories you tell yourself about money, right? Because that mindset for many of us is the money mindset is not a positive one and it is a barrier to success. And so it was like tr- jumping off a cliff for me, walking away from the salary that I had. But I had savings, you know, I had, I had money. I had invested and yeah, I had money behind me. And I've had to invest in myself because the other thing, like the roller coaster that we've spoken about, I've had some great years, right? And the best example, like I'll be completely honest, because I think people aren't freaking honest about this stuff. COVID was dire for me. Like COVID, I, you know, I went from traveling the world and speaking and having all of these unbelievable opportunities and getting a book publishing deal. I finished writing my first book three days before we went into Melbourne lockdowns. And Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world, apparently. And so COVID sucked my soul out. And every piece of business that I had, because I was a speaker, was cut off overnight. Six months of work, nothing. So here's the thing, when you think you've nailed it, <laughs> life will throw you a curveball. So I could have shut up shop, but I didn't. I decided, like, and this is what, what has happened. So I think having something behind you is really important because there have been times throughout this journey where if I didn't invest my own money in the business, I would have shut shop. Like I should, I I literally, I did consider, and I did a whole podcast on this, I did consider quitting in COVID because I felt like my soul was being sucked in. But equally it was a gift because it forced me to go and do my yoga teacher training. It made me go back to uni and study psychology because I had all this space because I wasn't on planes. It then prompted me to go and study trauma. Like these are all things I would never have done if COVID hadn't have come along. But I had to, you know, I had to suck up that it was going to have an impact on my savings. And being an entrepreneur has made a massive dent in my savings. But you know what? I don't regret any of it because if I look back to why I started my business, which I think so many of us disconnect from, we forget because we get so caught up in the novice. I started my business to make a positive impact on the lives of others. I started my business so that I could be there for the most formative years of my son and be present. And if that's cost me saving, then it was worth every fucking cent. That is my choice though, right? That is the choice that I've made. I'm not as wealthy as I used to be. I don't have as many things, but I chose not to have those things because for me, for me personally, they're not the things that make me happy. Doing the work that I'm doing makes me happy and showing up for my son makes me happy. And so that's the choice I've made. It's not the choice for everyone, but that's kind of a tangent on the money thing, right? I think money is one of those topics that does send us on a few tangents because it is so multi-layered. There's, you know, so much depth to our relationship to money and, you know, that humanistic tendency to feel safe and secure uh, along with trying to do what we want to do in the world and, you know, working through that is such a a work in progress for so many of us. So um, really great to share it and touch down on that a little bit and, and how it's playing a role in your headspace. And, you know, I think that is a really important lesson as well that not everyone one gets into business to make an extraordinary amount of money and be like financially free and it's perfectly fine if it is a purpose as well that's you know I guess that's the other thing like that's that's okay I love talking about money my listener will know that I always delve into it because I just think it's such a barrier like I can't tell you Penny how many times a day I flirt with the LinkedIn job section I'm like "Mm, yes oh my god (laughs) yes so here's the thing right so here that's and so can we talk about that please because oh my gosh I've just written 12 lessons of nine years in business right that's my next podcast series and the one I'm like you will look for jobs As an entrepreneur, you will look for jobs and know that that's okay. You need to do this. You need to go back and look for work. And some people do go back and that's fine. Like pick your own path. It doesn't freaking matter. It's long as it's an intentional choice and it's in alignment, you know, with with what you need now, that's completely fine. But I can tell you, I still look at jobs nine years on. And I say for me, you know, I do it because I need to remind myself of why I don't want to do it. And that's that, that's my journey, right? But there is no shame and no, I can tell your listeners, know that you are not freaking alone looking at the job section. <laughs> Everyone does it. Every entrepreneur. And anyone who says they're not is a liar. I'm sure of it. 
<laughs> oh, I actually, I really do laugh to myself because like, sometimes I look at it and I mean, you know, unfortunately here in Australia, like not enough people list their, their salary window. I wish they did and were more open with things like that. So you don't see a lot of that uh, in there, but sometimes I look at it and I go, oh, it looks like a really good gig. Like it seems like a lot of fun there. And then you scroll down to the, like the benefits, the workplace benefits. And it's like a day off for your birthday and like, yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, mm, God, this isn't this isn't going to work for me. <laughs> That's that isn't exactly enough value, and, and nor is it particularly a gift. You know, to be like, yay, like an extra day off that you can have for your birthday. It's like, yo, oh, how many hours of overtime am I going to be gifting to you for absolutely zero play that falls into your quote unquote contract of fair and reasonable overtime? <laughs> Come on, guys, let's get our values a little bit more aligned here. But you touch on something that I think is also a bit of a pink elephant when it comes to the, the life of the entrepreneur or the small business owner. And that is, like I said before, we become disconnected from why we started this business in the first place. And one of the reasons most people I speak to, because I work with purpose-led women in business, is that they want to create the freedom to work and live on their terms whilst making a meaningful difference in the world. And what I see when we step into our own businesses is this freedom, this day off, this magical, I'm only going to work between, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do a five hour work week. Whoa. It's bullshit. What I see <laughs> is we actually end up working more hmm. than we would have for someone else. And yes, granted it's for ourselves, but the freedom that we spoke about, like, it's so funny to me. I, I know, I know it because I struggled with it. It's like, I could take any day of the week off that I want. I really do. I really do. Because it's like, oh, but I could be doing that. I could be doing that. Like, and this is the problem. The work never ends, right? But I just think it's important to acknowledge the fact that remember why you started your business. Go back and connect with that meaning. And if it was to have more freedom and time to do certain things, maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, you could schedule in advance that magical day that you wanted to take off to just do something spontaneous. Yeah, I, I rate that a lot because it, it's reality. I, I find it really challenging. <laughs> this I feel like everyone's going to get this, but yeah, that conversation that you end up having with your friends who or your family who aren't on this journey, and it's like, but they ask like, how are you going? What are you up to? Like, oh, like for me, living uh, away from most of my friends and family. Oh, like maybe we could pop up for a weekend and like, I, you know, sort of like rocking in the corner a little bit, imagining people coming up for the weekend and they're like, oh, you know, you, you'll be able to like move your schedule around. Yeah. Like four days can clear like four days. I'm oh. like, oh, sweet baby Jesus. No, <laughs> like just because I can control my schedule. A, it doesn't mean that I necessarily want to because I am very comfortable with the fact that if I take time away from this, I suffer later. But just that misconception of uh, what it means to, to be working for yourself from those who don't quite understand it. And the fact that you're never off anyway, you have four days off to go and, and have a little little wander around, but you're still thinking about those things. You're still keeping an eye on the DMs and the leads and the inquiries that are coming through, making sure you don't leave people waiting too long. You're still, you're still on. It's never really off. Uh, it's good times. As your <laughs> business journey has, has changed and your, your personal journey has evolved, what do you wish that the version of you now in this stage of your business knew back then when you invested that $10,000 into the uh, platform development? Oh, <laughs> so many What do I wish that I knew? The first thing that I think is the most important is that it's a long game. And I think that that's very hard for people to accept when we live in a world of instant gratification and quick fixes. And so when everything that you see online is, you know, how I made six figures in five minutes, which is just bullshit, because I'm yet to meet anyone <laughs> that's done that. And equally, you know, how I'll help you make that. I just think it tells people this idea that there is a, a fast track, a quick way to become this highly successful seven-figure entrepreneur. And it's just, it, it's selling bullshit. And so the people I've seen that have been successful are the ones that play a long game. So it is a long game. I wish I knew that it was okay to doubt yourself. You know, self-doubt we'll always creep in. It's a natural, like you said, like we are wired to feel safe. And when we don't feel safe, our autonomic nervous system pops us into fight or flight. And knowing that this journey as an entrepreneur is going to compromise that feeling of safety consistently and understanding how that stimulates your central nervous system is really powerful because it gives you the awareness to be able to say, oh, 
I feel unsafe. Whatever's going on is triggering me. This is a completely normal response. That's okay. Let's just sit with this feeling and see what happens. Like that for me has been really powerful. The other thing I think for me I wish I had have known was that for me business should be about impact, not scale. I was told very early on that I should make sure whatever business I created was scalable and fast. And I've got to say, it distracted me for two years until I woke up and went, this is completely not in alignment with what I want. I was even invited into a tech accelerator to scale my business after I was um, published in the American Journal of Psychology Consulting and created a psychometric and this whole world leading concept around adaptability. But what I realized is the businesses I think of the future that are going to really differentiate themselves are the ones that want to have a positive impact. They are led by impact. The scale is an outcome of focusing on that impact. And so I wish I had have known it's about impact and scale is just a tech bro way of being like everybody else and sitting there and spinning wheels. That's what I wish I had have known. Really important learnings. I think so many of us go through this phase of seeking the scale versus seeking the impacts, getting comfortable with the two. I mean, I've definitely had and thought similar thought. It's it's a constant reminder of whatever it is for you that ticks that box. And the advice can only go so far. We're so vulnerable as business owners to what other people tell us we should be focusing on and, and so doubtful of our own voices through this process that it, yeah, it's a really tough one to, to grapple with. But yeah, the more you get to know yourself, which it sounds like you've done beautifully, uh, the easier it gets along the way. Penny, you have just shared so much gold. I mean, I was so looking forward to this conversation naturally anyway, because I, I you know, I think it's been a, a wonderful insight into the building of a business that's really impactful, but also some really, really helpful tools for the listener to take away. What do you hope is next for your business? It's funny. It's top of mind. I'm just updating my website. <laughs> I'm sure people can understand is it an yeah, arduous brutal. task um, because it's completely out of date and not in alignment with the work that I'm doing at the moment, but hopefully by the time this goes. <laughs> so once I've done that, the next step is I'm leaning into what I'm being called to do. So I have found that my coaching clients are now disproportionately purpose-led women who want to create the freedom to work and live on their terms through their business um, whilst making a meaningful difference in the world. But what I find is that most of them that reach out are, I don't know, between one and three years of their journey and they've created this business. And like you said, they're distracted by all of the noise of what they should be doing and all of the advice. And it's not living up to the dream and what they've got is chaos and what they long for is clarity. So I want to create, this is my idea, um, I want to create Freedom School. And so Freedom School is going to launch in April. This will be my next marketing campaign. And it is a school to learn how to actually build the foundation for a business that creates the freedom, the reason you went into the freaking thing in the first place. So basic business foundations so that people can actually create products that people want to buy and they're no longer scrambling and equally they're not spending ridiculous amounts of money being ripped off because I hear this all the time, ripped off by coaches selling promises that they just can't deliver. So watch this space. Freedom School's coming. It's a community for people who want to build their purpose-led businesses and step out of the chaos and into the clarity. Oh, well, it sounds fantastic. And of course, I will have the links to your website in the show notes so that listening can go and get around and check it out. But before then, I mean, you've shared so much today. You've shared so much about your story and through that hearing and learning from others, we often find ourselves and, you know, we're nothing without each other in this space, which is what this podcast is here for. But uh, in exchange, how can the listener and I support you to grow and, and perhaps even get you to freedom school? Oh, what a beautiful question. I would say if you like what you've heard, follow send me a DM, reach out. I'd love to connect. I love connecting. And I would say rather than do something for me, do something for yourself. And so my gift to your listeners to close this out would be perhaps the most powerful thing I've learned in the last 12 months. And that has been through my trauma studies with Dr. Gabor Maté, who's renowned globally in this domain. And it is when you feel shit, when you don't feel great, just ask yourself a simple question. And that is, what would self-compassion look like for me today? And drop into your heart and whatever it says, go and do that thing. Because if there's one thing I know, especially about female entrepreneurs, it's that we can be very unkind to ourselves. And self-compassion is a practice and it is a beautiful one. So I just invite you 
to perhaps have a play with that and see how it lands because it's been pretty transformational for me. I love that. And you've inadvertently just reflected uh, self-compassion for me last night looked like throwing everything in the fucking bucket and going and watching Vanderpump Rules for four hours. (laughs) So sometimes you've just got to do it and however it looks. That's a great one. (laughs) uh, You just have to do it sometimes and and stop beating yourself up so much. So very timely message for me, which is often the case in this podcast and hopefully a timely message for the listener as well. So Penny, been absolutely wonderful to spend this time with you today. Thank you for sharing your story with me. Kim, the questions have been magical. Thank you so much for creating this thing. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.